Today we're talking about exactly how you organise your miniatures into a functional army list to play a game of 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspecs Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're talking about an overview of how to make an army list for Warhammer 40k in 9th edition, this time talking from a bit more of a beginner friendly slant, hopefully to help people who aren't all that familiar with the game, or maybe haven't played in some time, as quite a lot of things have to change with army list construction when you're moving from 8th edition to 9th edition. In the video we'll discuss points and power level, how to field units in detachments and a whole army, pre-game abilities and choices, and also a few of the additional restrictions from match play, which further limit list construction a little bit. So first of all, when you're arranging your models into an army list, you need to decide on the type of game that you're playing, and also exactly what sort of size of game you're playing as well, to know how much stuff you can bring. There are three main game modes in Warhammer 40k, as Games Workshop likes to frequently remind us. There's open play, narrative play, and match play. Open play is the most basic entry level of 40k, and dispenses with quite a lot of the subtleties of the game, I'd say it's generally best for either new players or very casual players, who are either getting to grips with the game, or just want to have a very casual game, throw some dice around, and make some models blow each other up. Narrative play is the more campaign and story driven mode, and match play is designed to be the most balanced version of the game, trying to give different armies somewhat of a level playing field, if both are absolutely trying their hardest to defeat the foe. There are two balancing systems for how much you can take in an army in a game of 40k. These are points and power level. Open and narrative play tend to use power level, where match play tends to use points, but there wouldn't be anything stopping you from using points in the other two versions if you wanted to. Once you know which one you're playing, you then need to decide on the size of the game. There are four sizes in 9th edition, combat patrol, incursion, strike force and onslaught. Each of these have their own range of points and power level, as you can see down in the graphic at the bottom. It is a bit of a weird and confusing graphic this one, the points limit is per person, but for some reason they put the power level as the total power level for the entire game. It means that if, say, you are playing a combat patrol mission, the amount of points worth of models that you could bring will be up to 500, so each player would bring 500 points of models, but the power level will be up to 25, so you could bring 25 power level per player. There are subsets of missions within each category, you could say that you're going to play a certain narrative play mission from a supplement, or you could say that you were playing one of the Eternal War missions, say a Strike Force Internal War mission from the main rulebook. With that information locked down, you can now start to build your army list. Each army in 40k basically translates to a collection of units, and points and power level are the two balancing systems that tell you exactly how many units that you can include in the army. Power level is the quicker and less precise measure, so it's generally used for the less competitive versions of the game in narrative play and open play. You can usually find the power level for each unit on the datasheet, so as you can see for the Assault Intercessor squad here, they have a power level of 5, and in some of the text describing how many models you can have in the unit, if you take more than 5 Assault Intercessors in the squad, then the squad's power level increases to 10. So if you were playing a combat patrol game, you could spend 10 of your 25 power level available on one big squad of Assault Intercessors. I'd be aware that Games Workshop did update the power level for a lot of units recently. The ones in the codexes might not necessarily be accurate anymore. You can find the most up-to-date power levels on the big FAQ they did on the Warhammer community page. Or alternatively, they're automatically updated on the paid version of the 40k app, if you do happen to have that. In general, if you're playing a game with power level in mind, then you have to bear in mind that the general ethos isn't to build the most powerful list ever. Because it isn't very precise, some choices are just clearly much better than others. It takes no account of war gear whatsoever, so if you were looking to squeeze every amount of power out of the game, then you'd just give your squads all the most fancy gear in the world. That might lead to some slightly funny looking armies. For that reason, I'd usually just use power level as a way to approximate roughly similar sized games, when no player is trying to gain too much an advantage at the list building stage. The other way of balancing is with points, of course. These are used in match play and are far more granular. Basically every single model in a unit and every piece of war gear has its own points cost. So for every extra model and every piece of war gear that you add to your army, you're generally going to use more of your points limit, so it's a bit more precise than power level, where that's not necessarily the case. Points generally do tend to take a little bit longer to add up than power level, as you have to consult the tables in the back of each codex or in the chapter approved Munitorum handbook and look at both the miniature and any bits of war gear that they're armed with to see whether they have a points cost and how much it is. At the moment in the game, most of the points are found in the chapter approved Munitorum handbook, which was basically where they rebalanced all of the points for 9th edition to take account for the changes. Again, you can also find them in the paid version of the 40k app, and when the 9th edition codexes start to come out, they will likely make some points changes, and they will supersede the chapter approved handbook. 
For list building, I recommend Battlescribe to make things a bit easier. It's a free app that crowdsources data from 40k, and it means that you can see the points cost for each bit of war gear as you add it to the army, which makes life a lot easier, and it totals it all up for you at the end. Games Workshop is supposedly bringing out some sort of Battleforge on that 40k app, which will likely have similar functionality, but so far they haven't come out with that yet. In any case, for example, if I wanted to pay the points for an Assault Intercessor squad, I would look up the points cost of each model in the unit, which is currently 19, and then if they had any additional war gear that costs extra points, such as having a plasma pistol on the sergeant, I would look up the cost for that plasma pistol, which is 5 points, and add that to the total amount for the squad. So now we've talked about how to add units to your army, let's talk about which units you're allowed to add, and how they're organised within an army. Firstly, pretty much all games of 40k narrative and match play tend to use battle-forged armies. This is Games Workshop's fancy term for basically saying armies that follow their set of rules for making a normal sort of army construction, and it basically contains the rules for faction keywords, and also detachments. First of all, your army must all share the same faction keyword, usually it's fairly intuitive. Say for example, if you are playing orcs, the only faction keyword that they have is orcs, so you wouldn't be able to include a mainly orc army, and then add in an Eldar Wraith Lord, for example, as it's a completely different army, and they don't share any faction keywords. However, this does allow certain armies to add in allies, say all armies that fight for the Imperium of Man have the Imperium keyword, which means that you could have a force of Astra Militarum fighting alongside some space marines, as they all belong to the Imperium. You can do similar cross-book allied shenanigans with things like Chaos and Eldari, for example. From there, now you know that all your units are somewhat aligned with each other, they have to be organised into detachments, which represent small fighting forces of units that allow you to use certain types of units within the same command structure. All the units in 40k have a battlefield role, which you can usually see on their datasheet, with one of the symbols that you can see in that battalion detachment on the right. For example, leads and commanders tend to have that little skull icon, which denotes them as an HQ, or say that little triangle symbol, which is the symbol for troops in 40k. Each detachment will say exactly how many of what sort of units you can include in that detachment. For example, in that battalion detachment, you must have at least two HQs and three troops, and then you can potentially add one more HQ, up to three more troops, and then various other units that you can see there, including elites, fast attack, heavy support, flyers, and dedicated transports. This is basically another slight challenge to overcome when building an army list, as it makes it a little bit harder to say just take nothing but heavy support choices and load your army full of big guns. Most detachments in 40k cost command points, for example this battalion detachment would cost 3 command points, and there's various other detachments of different flavours that you can find in the main rulebook. For example, if you wanted to add in a whole load more heavy support choices, you might be tempted to take a spearhead detachment, where all you need is an HQ to lead it, and then you can take up to 6 heavy support choices, which allows you to get a lot more big guns in the army. A lot of armies tend to start with either a patrol detachment or a battalion detachment, as if you take your faction's leader, the warlord, in one of these detachments, then you get any command points spent on that detachment refunded, and it means that you can use those command points for other interesting abilities in-game. Finally, there's also a limit to the amount of detachments that you can take in different size games. As we said before, the four types of game size that you can play are Combat Patrol, Incursion, Strike Force, and Onslaught. You can only use one detachment in Combat Patrol, two in Incursion, three in Strike Force, and four in Onslaught. It kind of makes sense, in bigger games you're able to field more units. So using those rules, we can pick which units we're taking, organise them into one or more detachments, and they all have the same keyword. Once you've chosen the units in your army, there's some options for using certain pre-game abilities and making choices pre-game for certain powers such as psychic powers, relics and warlord traits. On your army list, you need to denote who's going to be the leader of the army. This has to be a character, and he can generate a warlord trait, an ability that usually makes him stronger in combat or better able to lead his troops. And in general, you need to write down the warlord and denote what trait he has on your army list. If you have any psychic users in your army, then you have to denote what psychic powers they know. You get to equip one of your characters with a relic, one comes for free in the same detachment as your warlord, and then most options have the opportunity to buy more with command points pre-game. Again, they should all be noted on the army list. Finally, pre-game stratagems that augment the abilities of various units in your army are generally expected to be written on your army list now. In 8th edition, these were choices that you could sort of flex out depending on your opponent, but in 9th, they're not quite so lenient. In general, you need to make the choices for whether these stratagems are going to be used as part of writing your army list and before you've seen your opponent's army. 
Finally, if you're playing a match play game in Warhammer 40k, there are a couple of other small restrictions, and a lot of people do tend to use them in more casual games as well. First of all, they have a rule that prevents mixing of certain units in detachments. You need to share another faction keyword that isn't Imperium, Chaos, Eldari, Inari, or Tyranids. So it means that, for example, if you wanted to have a detachment within your army, you couldn't mix both Space Marines and Astra Militarum Infantry. You could have them both in the same army, but they'd have to be in their own different detachments. It kind of makes sense to me how these factions would be expected to be fielded. The Space Marine forces would have their own individual army structure, and the Guard would have their own structure of command. Finally, the Rule of Three also makes its appearance here. This was a restriction that was brought in to prevent too much spam, and came in in early 8th edition. It basically states that you can't use any data sheet more than three times in your army. It doesn't apply to troops or dedicated transport vehicles, which you might expect to have lots and lots of the same type of unit as they're very much core units, but it can be quite good in preventing anything getting too silly, say if you had people just trying to spam one powerful unit, such as say having six repulsor executioners for example, it curtails that spam just a little bit, now you're going to have three at maximum. Again, it's not technically part of anything that isn't match play, but I generally think it's quite polite to conform to anyway, rather than inflicting too much spam on the opponent. Finally, I thought we'd just finish off with an example army list. This one isn't exactly designed to be the strongest army list in the world, but just demonstrates a reasonable way to put forward an army list when you're playing a game of 40k. In this army, we have an Imperial Army, we have a battalion of Space Marines, fighting alongside an Imperial Guard tank squadron. With most codexes, you get to choose what sort of chapter or regiment your army is from, so we've denoted the Space Marines to be Ultramarines in this list, and the Imperial Guard to be Vostroins provided the detachments aren't mixed, and it means that you can get some additional special rules for your forces. In this case, the Ultramarines can fall back and still shoot, and the Vostroans have a little bit of extra range for their guns. In the Ultramarines Battalion, we have it led by a Primaris Captain with a Power Sword and Mastercrafted Auto Bolt Rifle, and there's also a Primaris Lieutenant with a Bolt Pistol and Mastercrafted Auto Bolt Rifle as well. The Captain is denoted as our Warlord, he has the Warlord traits the Imperium Sword for some extra fightiness on the charge, and he's also equipped with a relic, that power sword is being upgraded to the Burning Blade, so he should be a pretty fearsome adversary to fight in melee. From there we have three squads of ten intercessors, they're all armed with standard bolt rifles compared with the other bolt rifles that you can arm them with, and each of the sergeants is armed with a thunder hammer. In the fast attack section we have four inceptors with assault bolters, and in heavy support we have ten hell blasters with plasma incinerators. In general you don't need to write down every single piece of war gear that every model has, usually it's just best to write down the ones that you actually have the option to change. For example the inceptors could take their plasma weapons instead of assault bolters, so you need to write it down on the army list. The Astra Militarum are fielded in a spearhead detachment, in their HQ slot they have a tank commander armed with a demolisher cannon and a heavy bolter, and in the heavy support section they have three units of Lehman Ross battle tanks, each with one tank in, armed with a demolisher cannon and a heavy bolter. There'll be plenty of anti-tank firepower coming out of these guys. Because we've used another detachment and used a spearhead one, that would cost us three command points, so it basically means that our army will be starting with nine command points, rather than the twelve command points that we'd have for a strike force mission. This army is built around being two thousand points, and I would bear in mind that sometimes there are disadvantages to having different forces within the same army. For example, if you'd included nothing but space marines in the army, then they'd be able to activate their combat doctrines and get extra AP on all their guns. Because the guardsmen are here, that actually breaks that rule, and it might make the space marines a little bit less effective as a result, but you do get the option of having units from outside the space marine codex. In any case, that's just a quick example to show what a normal army list could look like. So I hope that's been at least somewhat helpful to you. I know a lot of this will be really obvious for people who have played a lot of 9th edition already, but I honestly don't think it's the most intuitive process to anyone picking up the game. Feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics if you'd like to see more like this and other tactics related content. And if you have been enjoying my videos, I'd just like to mention that the channel has a Patreon page, which you can find down in the video description below. Making all of these videos does take quite a lot of time, and if you are enjoying regularly, then any support is greatly appreciated. It really is what allows me to keep on going with this channel as a bit more of a full time thing. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.